before the 19th century, people knew who they were. You couldn't ask somebody before 1800 what he was and expect to get anything less in Western civilization than I'm a Christian. That is, the sect may vary, but it was part of the world. Atheism really wasn't an alternative. Agnosticism <coughs> wasn't. Um, I'm talking about Tom Jefferson this week to my American Lit students, who for us is a deist, which is sort of a thin Christian, right? <laughs> um, but all the same, if you ask Jefferson, are you a, are you a, do you believe in God? He would say, of course I believe in God. Now, I may rearrange the Bible, which he did, to fit his own taste, but it wasn't conceivable to him that there wasn't somebody who made the world. It got harder as time passed. And for me, the most interesting period, probably in the last 300 years, is the period that Hardy lives through, and Hosman lives through, and Hopkins lives through. Now, they reflect that difficulty in different ways. And they, the three H's is what I always think about them. Hopkins will do next week, and Hopkins is a priest. And I don't think you will find more powerful or effective devotional Christian poetry than you'll get out of Hopkins. Uh, he can express glory, a Christian sense of glory, greater than anybody, right? Uh, the grandeur of God is what he calls it in one, and I don't know any poetry that does it well. Uh, he al also, he can express uh, Christian despair, right? His own sense of insignificance in ways that, that uh, stun one. But the power of his poetry is very much a product of the 19th century. Uh, he's committed himself in certain ways, and he knows the difficulty. Now, let me put him aside. We'll pick him up next week. The most representative of this whole period, I think, is Hardy, in many ways. If you have uh, remembered Hardy, you probably have remembered him as a <coughs> novelist. And Hardy wrote large numbers. He must have 25 or 30 novels, at least, that you all know, at least by reputation, if you haven't read them. Tess of the D'Urbervilles, right? Jude the Obscure, Far from the Madding Crowd. By 1890, Hardy had already established himself as probably the premier novelist. But if you remember Hardy's fiction, you remember that his fiction is bleak and bleaker and bleaker. And the world in which he lives, it's not a world in which God doesn't exist, but a world in which you can't rely on God, uh, that he's not going to interfere God has created certain jokes that he plays on us. And from the beginning in Hardy's fiction, you sense that he's moving down towards the real despair of Jude the Obscure, which was his last novel. What's interesting to me about that is that when I, when I think about Hardy, I think he's the most problematic of all writers for me. I don't understand why I read Hardy. I know a lot about literature, and I know who writes good books and who writes bad books. But I also know that if I'm, if I'm having an emotionally difficult time, if I'm under pressure, for some reason, I want to read a Hardy novel. Um, when I was doing my preliminary examinations for the PhD, I found myself reading Hardy throughout that whole period. <laughs> and I was so nervous and so tense, I had a tick in my eye for <coughs> two years, I think. And while I was doing that, I was reading Under the Greenwood Tree and A Pair of Blue Eyes, I mean, even minor Hardy novels. And I always knew when I was reading them that I could see all the flaws in Hardy's novels. I don't believe that the world is as chance-oriented as he does. And you read Hardy's novels, and if you remember, the strangest things happen. Remember Tessie Obscure? She writes an important letter, slips it under a door, and of course it goes under a rug. It's never found. For Hardy, the world plays those tricks on him all the time. Right? You're not going to get God as the Puritans would believe in their involving and affecting life. Part of the world is that this is it. The bad is there with the good. And whoever runs the world above us is just as likely to play a joke at our pain and our expense as to give us joy or pleasure. Well, this sort of random universe that Hardy lived in and was trying to come to terms with is what his poetry and his fiction is about. By the time he wrote Jude the Obscure, Hardy was simply saying too much. And the world did not want to hear what he had to say. The critics went after him. If you know Hardy's dates, Jude the Obscure came out in the 1890s. He was born in 1840. Okay, so he's in his mid-50s. He's already a major novelist. And he says to the world around him, all right, you don't like my novels? Stuff it. Right? I'm going to write poetry now until I die. Well, he didn't know whether he was going to live to be 88. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so Hardy quit writing fiction and wrote poetry for the next 28 years of his life. 
And many critics today feel that he's a more important poet than he is a, a novelist. He is a difficult poet, I think, to argue in some ways. I talked with Mary last night on the phone, and I was saying some of the things that I've felt for years. And then last night, after I talked to you, I was looking through the poems. And this morning, I had a uh, second hour free on Wednesdays, and I was reading them again, mm -hmm. deciding how I wanted to talk to you. And, and I said, well, I wasn't telling the truth. I like these poems. <laughs> uh, I really do like them. And often, Hardy is unusually beautiful as a poet. Now, he comes, and I was thinking, why do I feel that I don't think he's as good a poet as Hopkins or Hausman? I don't think he's a craftsman in the same way. But all the same, when Hardy speaks to you, he's talking about some of the crucial experiences of somebody alive in 1900 who sees it harder and harder and who wants to believe in those who can't believe. Knows that science has taken over, right? Nature has taken over, and the God who was there participating in life is gone. It's not going to help you anymore. I want to read to you a, a paragraph. Uh, well, this is by Irving Howe, describing some of Hardy's multiplicity. And then let's turn to some of the poems and read them together and see what we get. See how you feel afterwards. I was uh, thinking this morning, I can't do Hardy in less than three sessions. <laughs> but I will do Hardy in less than three <laughs> sessions all the same. Here's a paragraph by Irving Howe. This is from uh, the Atlantic Magazine's Brief Lives, a, uh, sort of a dictionary of literary figures. Like many great or near great writers, Thomas Hardy is an elusive, almost protean figure. The more one reflects upon his work, the more it seems to grow into multiplicity. We can read him as a philosopher, spinning fables of determinism, an elegist of rural simplicities, a poet of tenderness, a Christian whose faith has been hollowed by skepticism, a country pagan whose mind is covered over with Christian pieties, an imaginative historian of the revolutionary changes in 19th century moral consciousness, an autodidact who keeps stumbling into sublimities of intuition. Well, that's a curious and interesting paragraph, but it touches on a lot of the feelings you have about Hardy. I know inside that one of the reasons I read Hardy novels is that when you enter Wessex, when you enter his world, you enter a world where country England reigns. Okay. I, I know that I don't really care very much about the main characters in a Hardy novel, but the world of his rural villages, okay, his people who go about their lives, in a sense they're in tune with the world around them, survives. The only novelist I can compare with Hardy, and it's, it sounds like a downgrading, but I don't think it is, is, uh, is Walter Scott, because Walter Scott creates a world. Uh, he's like a caricature of Hardy in some ways, because I never liked the Scott plots, and I don't like the Scott major figures, but the minor figures that inhabit a novel by Sir Walter Scott live so vividly that you want to read them anyway. Uh, Hardy's much better, I think. His major plots are more interesting. We've seen tests recently, probably. Uh, but the world is the same. Right? It's a narrow world of rural England in which people are in tune with the world around them. And when I am not in tune with the world around me, I find I like to read Hardy. And I say, I don't like what he's doing here. I don't like his symbolism. It's too crass. It's too obvious. But I like this world. I like this little village. Does that make sense? I want to be in Casterbridge tonight instead of, <laughs> instead of Seattle. The experience of reading Hardy is not always invigorating. Just the opposite, I think. Hardy makes me feel makes me feel sad about life. He makes me feel that um, it's not easy to be a sensitive human being, looking at the world around you, knowing that we don't have what our grandparents had. Um, I was uh, thinking about this this week. I went to an archdiocesan conference and uh, listening to three wonderful lectures by a moral theologian who was talking about how the how the church has to change and continue changing away from legalism. He said one of the great weaknesses of the Catholic Church over the years has been that it has bowed to the natural desire to know the truth. He said that the uh, theologians in the 19th century knew because they figured it out that if you looked lustfully at a woman for 30 seconds, it was a mortal sin. Less than 30 seconds was all right. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I thought at the time, if I had known that when I was 15, you know, what a difference it would have made. <laughs> um, 
that's a desire. It's a natural desire, as Father Riley said, right? If we could know when we're saved and when we're damned. And the church has always been very strong in giving you that absolute answer. If you have an absolute question, right? Is abortion a sin? Yeah, it is. But the question is not the act, right? But why is a woman driven to it? Right? Why must we pity and love this woman who's brought to an act which is in itself a sin? It's a marvelous lecture. See, Hardy is in that same world. It's the world that, don't, that won't give you answers. Is there a God? Well, no, I'm not going to tell you anymore, right? Is there an act which is in itself good or bad? Well, that's gone too. And on the verge of his life coming up is, as you remember, World War I, which is going to explode the insecurity that he's talking about into a million pieces. And after him, you've got F. Scott Fitzgerald, right? You've got the lost generation. So we see the 20th century on the, on the horizon when you read Hard Hardy, and it makes you sad because we're seeing gone or lost what was very important right, at one time. And he's most sensitive to it. As I was reading these poems this morning, I thought, this is good. This is really good poetry. And I told Mary last night I didn't think he was very good. <laughs> <laughs> so I have, I'm, I'm going to try to see if I have enough. I have about 15 here. Some of you may have to look on. I was uh, using the duplicate uh, machine at Eastside Catholic. I didn't want to press my, <laughs> my luck too far. <laughs> I may have enough here. We'll see. These are just single sheets. You may look at it. Maybe you can find something in there. <laughs> Let's start out tonight, today, with uh, the first poem on the text here, page 11, half. This is not his most lyrical poem, but it's a good one to start off with Hardy. Uh, I think it, in some ways it symbolizes, along with maybe the darkling thrush, a certain attitude towards life for him at this point. Remember, he's not a child anymore. He's lived long enough to know that life is not going to reward you because you work hard and do well. He says, if but some vengeful God would call me from up the sky and laugh, thou suffering thing, know that thy sorrow is my ecstasy, that thy love's loss is my hate's profiting. Then would I bear it, clench myself, and die Steeled by the sense of ire unmerited, half eased, and that a powerfuller than I had willed and meted me the tears I shed. But not so. How arrives it joy lies slain? And why unblooms the best hope ever sown? Crass casualty obstructs the sun and rain, and dicing time for gladness. Simone. These purblind doomsters had as readily strewn blisses about my pilgrimage as pain. Very powerful poem. And I think anybody who's lived long enough to know that your hopes don't come around necessarily um, can feel the strength of this. Does it remind you of anybody? It might remind you of Captain A. If you've read Moby Dick, right? Ahab says, I don't care what you are, but you are whatever it is. He calls it the motiveless malignity of the world that presses on me. And Ahab's heroic stance to stand up and say to the world, you won't tell me what you are, but if you can hit me, I can hit you back. Right? If the sun attacks me, I can attack the sun. We know he's crazy. I mean, Ahab is crazy. He's a monomaniac. But all the same, there is a nobleness about this refusal to be crushed by the way things are. Right? Ahab carries the haphazardness of life on him. He's got a scar right down here, right? From right down, his, he's got one leg missing. When Starbucks says, well, the, the whale was just protecting himself. 
that's not an answer. I have lost a leg, <laughs> right? There's that the human being wants reasons. And so he says, if you could give me a reason for life being the way it is, that's that if but. If but some vengeful God would call to me from up the sky and laugh. Would he like that? Well, what he wants is a loving God, obviously. But if I can't have a loving God, I want a God, you see? I want a God who says to me, Thomas, you suffering thing, I want you to know that thy sorrow is my ecstasy. It gives me pleasure to see you in pain, all right? That thy love's loss is my profiting, my hate's profiting. I hate you, Thomas. He says, all right, that gives me an opponent, right? If I knew that God was after me, then I would say, then would I bear it, punch myself, and die, right? All right. What you want is that sense of, I know what's happening here. There's a reason behind it, steeled by the sense of ire unmerited. What does that mean? The ire, sense, steeled by the sense of ire unmerited. Ah, he didn't do anything to merit that anger of God. Would that give him strength? Yes. Sure, sure, you see. What did I do to deserve it? All right, do me in. I can't help it if I'm caught by a 300 pound martial arts expert in an alley, right? I mean, all I can do is take what he gives me and maybe die and say, all right, do it. I can't fight back. And he wants that sense of, all right, if this is it, this is it. That would be fine. I would take that as an alternative to a loving God if I had to. But you see, in his world, in the world of, you don't get a God who hates you, right? It's much better off to be living in Sodom and Gomorrah because at least you know you did something and you're getting punished for it. And things are clear. But in the turn of the century, things are not clear. And the uncertainty is what drives them crazy, half eased, in that a powerful than, than I had willed and meted me the tears I shed. It doesn't mean that he's eased, you see, right? But that it's better knowing than not knowing. Um, I think with kids, when you spank children, this is that attitude. I mean, a child knows whatever he does, he gets a spanking. He's up against somebody powerful than he, more powerful. If I spank my son, he's in a world in which at least he has the awareness that he is nine and I am 37, right? That he is a child, I am a father. He is naughty, I spank him. And I don't abuse him, but I spank him. So there's a certain a re relationship that works. You can't fight someone 37 when you're nine, right? You can't do it. So that there's a comfort involved. Children need to know their limits, after all. And they will test their limits often to see if it's still there. <laughs> then you get the awful, the awful beginning of the next stanza. It's not so. It isn't that God loves me. It's not that God hates me. These things cannot come. And then that's this terrible, how arrives it? Joy lies slain. How does it come about? Um, next week, I'll give you a prelim, a preview. Right? And every time I read this, I think of um, a marvelous poem by Hopkins. If I can find it here. He says, <coughs> Thou art indeed just, Lord, if I contend with thee. But, sir, so what I plead is just. Why do sinners wait? And why must disappointment fall I in that name? It's the great lament of the Old Testament, right? Why, why do sinners prosper, right? Why isn't it that being good is rewarded on earth? Ecclesiastes knows this, right? They know it in the Bible. God isn't going to make you happy and wealthy because you're good. You might suffer like Job until you die. It's the same idea that he's working on here. How arrives it? Joy and I slain. Why unbelieving is the best hope that was ever seen. The image there is you cast your seeds. Put them down. I was telling a colleague about my getting East Side Catholic, this job. And, uh, and he said, well, I what do you mean? He said, well, you're too good a teacher not to be teaching. 
He says, you cast your bread upon the waters, right? And it comes back. <laughs> it, it, just so happened, it just so happened that it did. But this is not the world where your bread comes back, you see? The world that he's talking about, you cast your bread upon the waters, it's just like it'll sink. There's no, there's no connection between the two. And then you get the Hardian world, crass casualty. That means things happen casually. Right? It doesn't mean casualty like, a, like an, an automobile accident. It means casualness. Do you get a job? Do I get a job? Maybe I do, maybe I don't. Um, I was that close to not teaching in the summer. I did teach because I taught, I got a job. But I didn't have to teach. I was lucky. He could have signed up for another class. He would have seen me, and I would be doing heaven knows what. Crass casualty obstructs the sun and rain. What does that refer to, by the way? See the line before it? How arrives it? Joy lies slain, and why at noon the best hope ever sown? That's right. That's right. Yeah, it goes with the image of blue. If you throw your see, farmers depend upon a certain natural sequence of events. You plant your seeds, you have rain, you have sun, you have a crop. You have a hope, a good hope. You get your sun and rain. Might, might be a miserable year. And all the work goes down the drain. And dicing time for gladness casts them all. What is dicing time? Oh, the turn of the dice. You throw it on the table, right? If I throw the right dice up, 7 11, 2, right, whatever it is, uh, you win. You'd be happy, right? Okay? Throw me my dice. So here they are. You're right in Las Vegas. Out it comes. What do you get? Snake eyes. Yeah. Right? <laughs> That's how you get happiness, you see, in his world. If somebody throws a pair of dice, you win. Another pair, you don't. If my student had signed up for another class, I'd be on the unemployment line right now. Is this what life is like? Well, then you get his last lines. These purblind boosters. That is readily so in this is about my privilege. I just can't stand this world where you get your lucky, your unlucky, your happiness or your sadness, just by chance. When you think back to your own lives and how often we have been happy or sad just by accident, you cross the street at the wrong time. Because I had that wonderful fiddler on the roof where he said God would have, would have changed some immortal plan if I were a rich man. Yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> just, yeah. Absolutely. This is the, mind, the most minor of all experiences. But there, there's, there's at least a plan. Yeah, yeah but it's, re it's, it's retrospective plans. This is not a plan. No. And that's what drives a man. He wouldn't mind being on the bad side, but to be on the side where you can't find the truth. It drives him bad. What's worse? It's like uh, when we were growing up, the nuns would always say, well, it was God's will. And you could, I could accept anything. Sure. I remember a woman who lost her husband and children, and, and everybody admired her because it was God's will. That's right. But if you really matured, and then it would drive mm -hmm. you mad. One of the oddities is that that's a heritage for us of our Puritan past. Yes. That is, the, it isn't Catholics that are providential in their awareness the way it is we Americans who are descendants of the Puritans. The Puritans looked for God's will in the world around them. And when something bad happened, it was providence. It was a sign. And that is, no matter what your religion is, we as Americans carry that with us. We are the blessed nation. We are the city on the hill. Losing the Vietnamese war to a Puritan is a sign that we have failed. And God is telling us, you no longer win just because you're my people. But that's, that's our heritage. But it's not a hardy, right? Nope, nope. It's not God's will. It's accident. Let's try a, a neutral tone. It's the next one here. Supposed to be one of his best poems. As you can see me having written in the margin there. We stood by a pond that winter day, and the sun was white, as though chidden of God. And a few leaves lay on the starving sod and had fallen from an ash and were gray. Your eyes on me were as eyes that roved over tedious riddles of years ago. 
and some words played between us to and fro on which were, on which lost the more by our love. The smile on your mouth was the deadest thing alive to have the strength to die. And a grin of bitterness swept her by like an ominous bird of wing. Since then, keen lesson that love deceives and rings with wrong have shaped to me your face the God-cursed sun bear those, those words that the smile on your mouth was the deadest thing alive to die. You'll see that one, something that Hardy's able to do is to set very strongly a mood and a place. I mean, the world, Hardy's world outside fits the world inside. And if you remember reading Hardy's novels, when people are having a miserable time, it's usually winter. Or uh, raining. Right, or raining miserably when they're happy the sun shines. And this poem shows that same point. I think the key to this poem is the title. You reach a certain enervation kind of poem. Right? People, one of my colleagues is getting married December 19th. She's 23, will be 23. And she's all happy because she's planning her marriage and doing color. She's talking about it. Just graduated from college. And, uh, and I remember getting married. I was married 14 years ago. And I remember thinking of the future you live to you get where you are. She can't imagine what she's talking about here. There was a time when we loved each other. And, but anybody who's lived with somebody else knows that the elation of new love changes to other kinds of relationships. It doesn't have to happen the way it happens here. It doesn't. But the poem is getting at change. Right? Uh, moods. Uh, when you're newly married, you don't have neutral tones. Everything's in bright colors. But eventually, neutral tones will come. You notice the coloration? Yes, gray, beige. And he's setting that scene. One, we stood by a pond that winter day, and the sun was white. I thought, children of God. What does that mean, children of God? It's God scolded. Yeah, so God scolded and chided, so we would say. Yeah, real, he's, huh? right. So already, relationships are not right. right? And a few leaves lay on the starving. Uh, you see what's happening here? It's fall. The leaves are falling. But what happens to the ground? The ground is starving. It's leaving something. They had fallen from an ash. Great. One of Hardy's strengths as a poet is the image. You can see these leaves. A few of them lying on this. The gray leaves, right? Lying on the hungry grass. I like the term starving here because it's an internal word, right? The, the sod needs water, probably. But here it is. The gray. Pale white sun, not yellow sun. The leaves themselves are gray. They're not red. I was telling students about Vermont this morning. No, it's not Vermont in the fall. Your eyes on me were as eyes that rolled over tedious riddles years ago. And some words played between us to and fro, on which lost the more by our love. What does that mean? They're speaking. Which one of us lost the one? Yeah. Yeah. Can you guess that? They're talking about what you gain and what you lose by loving. It's all over, in other words, right? And they're talking about their memories, their experiences. Um, we're scheduled to do Whitman in the spring. Whitman has a marvelous pair of few lines in Song of Myself where he talks about a lover getting up in the morning and finding that his lover has gone and left roomfuls of baskets covered with white towels and swelling. And he says, shall I scream at my eyes that they linger from looking down the road and instead add up who's ahead and who's behind? Right? What his eyes want to do is to watch the lover go down the road. But he knows that that's not smart, right? So what you do is say, all right, Who's ahead and who's behind in this? Right? That comes. This is not the way you run a relationship. You don't say, I have gained three points on her today, right? <laughs> um, so that when it's all over, I'm ahead. You see the point? You don't. Some people do. <laughs> you suppose he wrote that after his first wife died? Whitman didn't have a wife. 
I mean, no, no, oh, no. Okay. I mean, this, this Paul McCartney. Um, 67. I don't think she was dead yet. Oh. I, I'm not sure about that. Oh, no. All I know is that it's a poem about love. And, of course, who loses the war? And then you see they're talking. The smile on your mouth was the deadest thing alive to have the strength to die. And the grin of bitterness swept thereby. Like an ominous bird of wing. Ominous implies the future. Like it's not over yet. These poems remind me, if you remember him, of, uh, of uh, Meredith. Have any of you read Meredith's poetry on uh, modern love? Where he talks about the disintegration of this marriage to uh, Mary Love Peacock. She, he, he, is, he is the most uh, awful, wonderful sonnet sequence called Modern Love. A really ter terrifying poem in some ways about a marriage at the same rate and the consequences. But I'm reminded of this here. Uh, Meredith wrote uh, The Egoist, The Ordeal of Richard Trevor. Was it not? Somebody ever Very hard man. Wasn't he hard editor? He was alive at the same time. He died about 83. Since then, keen lessons that love deceives and rings with wrong have shaped to me your face. The God cursed son. That takes you back to the opening line, right? And the tree, the palm, the edge of the grace leaves. You, somehow, somehow you have to connect that last stanza with the previous one. As ominous implies the future, and then the next very next word is since that time. Is he right? Love deceives. Um, I'm understanding what they mean by love is blind for the first time this fall, because when the students are 15 and 16, they're reading the other sets for the first time, and they just fall head over heels in love. And I always thought love is blind meant to bl blind to the faults of the person you love, but that's not it. <laughs> love is blind to everything else. <laughs> <laughs> just the grades just drop. <laughs> love is they're, they they think they're in paradise, and then they get their grades. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it deceives radically. Yeah. All right, that's enough of that one. I turn to, let's see, number four I have on this list, I would like, to number 17. This is uh, The Darkling Thrush, uh, probably the most famous poem Hardy wrote. And I want to do some of the soberer ones first. We'll get to some lighter ones with some possible hope later on. You'll see a shift in Hardy's attitudes at this point. One of the difficulties that he had was that he had to see in the world around him that nature seems to imply an understanding that he can't see. Repeatedly, he will say in his poetry, that bird knows something I don't know. Because what would make a bird sing? on December 31st of 1900, beginning of the new century. The problem is, of course, that for us reasoning creatures, there's no connection. We can't, we can't make it. We've already given up. And this is a very sober poem about that shift from the 19th to the 20th century. It's the last day of the century, and he's thinking about what's the future going to be like. Darkling means the thrush singing in the dark. Okay. I leaned upon a coppice gate, and frost was specter gray, and winter's dregs made desolate the weakening eye of day. The tangled bind stems scored the sky like strings of broken lyres, and all mankind that haunted nigh had sought their household fires. Opening line, as the middle of winter and everything is dead. There is no, so often his bones are at that point, no green, no sun, no blue, nothing. He's leaning on a gate, okay, when frost was specter gray, and he's looking at the world. In the dead of winter, winter's dregs made desolate the weakening eye of day. What would winter's dregs mean to you? The, the dregs of snow, the dirty snow. All right, yeah. It's the end of, right? Winter is at its worst. Everything, is, the dregs are the bottom of the bottle, right? And it's unpleasant, it's bitter. And so the dregs of winter, which is the bottom, least pleasant part of winter, you get dregs, desolate, and the weakening eye of day. What time of day would it be? Evening. Evening. Yes, late evening on a winter night when there's no strength to the light at all. So everything should feel, as you walk, as you're reading this poem, weak, unpleasant, right, neutral, bleak, 
He's looking around. The tangled vine stems score the sky like strings of broken lyres. What's he looking at? He's seeing the right, and he sees no. Of course, there are no leaves. It's deep in winter, and the the stems of the plant is like he says strings of broken lyres intertwined. He sees them again. But scoring means to scrape, right? So as they move in the wind, you can see these 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 thorns reaching up and scraping the sky intertwined, and if you know much poetry, you know that a lyre is an important image, right? It's what it's the symbol of poetry, creation. So it's another sign. The lyre is broken. You know, it's not the Aeolian harp, right? Nature isn't telling you it's music. It's instead just the opposite. It's nothing. There's no music. And it's scoring the sky as though it were angry, right? Tired, attacking all mankind that haunted nigh off their household fires. In other words, everybody who lived in this area is home, right? around the fireplace, except Thomas Hardy. The land's sharp features seem to be the century's corpse of late. He's seeing, of course, there's no softness because all the plants are dead. He sees the outline of the land, and it looks like, he says, night. I imagine what he's thinking in terms, especially as a corpse, sunken flesh, right? In his days, no, they wouldn't have people all fixed up so they look like they're ready to get out of their coffin. <laughs> so for him, the image of a corpse is of right, sunken flesh, the bones sticking, laying out. And it's the 19th century, his century. He's lived most of his life, 60 years, watching this century go. His crypt, the cloudy pulse of the germ and birth has shrunken hard and dry. Every spirit on earth seems perfect. So, is that a nice image? <laughs> the ancient pulse of German birth, there is what we're talking about in the other poem, you see. In the old days, and even today, you'll often hear somebody say, well, I know it's the dead of winter, but what do you know? Spring is coming. Spring is coming, right? If winters uh, come, can spring be far behind, right? I mean, this is just, it's automatic, but not here. This is the end of something. And the, the crucial word here, I think, is frivolous. He himself feels like that corpse. The reason he's responsive this way to the world around him is that he feels unenergetic. If, yes, you're right. If you're thinking, how could you write such a wonderful poem if you don't have any creative impulse? But we don't ask that of a poet. So he's watching totally without spirit. At once, a voice arose among the deep twigs overhead in a full-hearted evening song of joy illimited. An aged thrush, frail, gaunt, and small, in blast beruffled plume, had chosen thus to fling his soul upon the glowing, through the growing gloom. So little cause for carolings of such ecstatic sound written on terrestrial things afar or nigh around, that I could think there trembled through this happy good night air some blessed hope for our evening lives. So it's a lovely ending, of course. Mm -hmm. um, you notice if you look at that for a second that this bird has no excuse for singing, right? I mean, it's not that he's young and in love. He's not warm and comfortable. He's not praising anything. He's just as miserable as the setting, right, this thrush. He's uh, an aged thrush, so he's nearing death, frail, gaunt. In other words, he's starving to death, right? He's small, and his, the winds have just blown his feathers all to pieces. And yet something in that bird impels it to sing, as he says, full-hearted even song of joy illimited. You take those words and you have to set them up against a word like a word like a frivolous. Whatever it is in that bird makes it sing, right? At the end of the 19th century, the bird does not know this is December 31st, 1900, right? He doesn't care about that. And it's this minor, little tiny touch that reminds him that he doesn't know everything, right? That all he has is his own experience. Part of his problem as a human being is that Hardy is aware that he 
must live in the context of the century in which he lives, the ideas in which he lives. If he were a bird, that would all be meaningless. But what he, saw, what he sees is the lessening of faith, lessening of certainty. You don't ask a bird of certainty. A bird sings because it sings. That's just what birds are doing. It doesn't know enough to be miserable. He could wish that he could be miserable, right? But he's not. He's not a bird. And he could wish that he could be miserable and sing, but he's not a bird, and he has to know it. I think watching closely, you'll see something like this. I could think that trembled through his happy good night air. Okay. Hearing that made me think, all right, maybe there is some blessed hope for what he knew and I was unaware. Emily Dickinson says, hope, right, do you know what hope is? A thing with feathers. A thing with feathers that perches in the soul, right? And it never asks you, it's just there. Against all evidence, you still hope. This is that. He doesn't have hope. Hope implies expectations of the future. And a reasoning mind would say, it's obvious that this bird doesn't have any expectations of the future. It's just there. I mean, birds are there, they sing, they sing for the moment. But for him, it has to do with the past and the future. This is the beginning of the 20th century. All right? Maybe. But you notice he doesn't come down and say it. You know, there's Hardy. Now, another poet would say, ah, it reminded me. It reminded me that there is no reason why the 20th century can't be a wonderful century. But it didn't convince me of that. All it showed to me was that I don't know everything. I'm limited to my own perspective, my own world. This is one of his most famous poems, a very good poem. And I think most of us like Hardy the most. Not that he gives up. He doesn't give up. But that he doesn't become dogmatic. Right? He never comes out and says, there is no God. There is no hope. He says, boy, if I could have it that way. I would have it that way. Let's make a quick shift. I wanted to um, turn to number to uh, the oxen on page 37. I'll give you a break in a minute or two. Here you see this in a religious term. Christmas Eve, page 37. And 12 of the clock. Now they are all on their knees, an elder said, as we sat in a flock by the embers in hearthside ease. We pictured the meek, mild creatures where they dwelt in their strawy pen, nor did it occur to one of us there to doubt they were kneeling them. So fair a fancy few would weave in these years. Yet I feel, if someone said on Christmas Eve, come, see the oxen, in the lonely barton by yonder whom our childhood used to know. And I should go with him in the gloom. Hoping it might be so. I love this moment. I think it's really a marvelous. Now here's the adult, right? He's thinking about when he was a kid. When you're a child, you know, right? And as you say, when sister says, this is what God will say, yes, that's right. right? Um, and when he was a boy, he remembers every Christmas Eve, an old man would say, Ah, midnight. It's an old myth, a rural myth in England, that at midnight, on, New on Christmas Eve, all the animals get on their knees to honor Christ's birth. Of course, you say it when you're sitting at the fireside, right? You're not out there looking. But you see what he says? We picture then the meek, mild creatures where they dwelt in their straw pen. Nor did it occur to one of us there to doubt they were kneeling. It never would have occurred to a, a child growing up in England in 1850 that when the myth is said, it's not true. I remember myself walking from home to church in a snowstorm in December and thinking about these things and trying to understand how did they happen. Right? How did they happen? I must have been maybe eight or ten. I was going to choir practice. I think it was a perfect Christmas, you know, Christmas event in Wisconsin. The snow was falling gently. And and I remember I was singing to myself about uh, Oh Holy Night or something like that, and thinking about these and trying to make a, an attitude towards them, but incapable at that age of doing anything same, except saying this is the way they were. I couldn't see them as mythology, for example, as necessary faith. They were just facts. For children, I like that. And then you get that shift to adulthood, right? And the child doesn't, my, my, my daughter said yes, last night at supper, Daddy, does God have a beard? <laughs> well, 
<laughs> See, my wife is very easy with that, but I like to tell the truth. <laughs> so I said, well, I believe God doesn't have a faith, a face. <laughs> uh, she's only five. So anyway, you see the problems you get. For her, it's pretty clear, not for me. And that beginning of the third stanza brings us up. I mean, none of us here, for that's not a, for us, that's not a, not a question. No adult worries whether God is revered or not. Right? Children believe it. And there we, he speaks for us. So fair a fancy few would be in these years. Not many people would say, let's go out and see the animals <laughs> on their knees. However devout you are, see, that's mythology. You don't expect it to happen. And then you get the yes. He knows the truth. He knows that animals aren't. If they're down there, it's because they're sleeping, and that's it. Right? God does not give us those indications of his presence that he might have given 2,000 years ago. And we have to live on faith instead. Right? How easy, how wonderful. Imagine if this actually happened. There'd be no atheism any place if you could just watch the animals every Christmas get down on their knees, right? It would solve all problems. And he wishes it were like that. It's that same desire, you see, for 30 seconds, and then I'm damned, I'm damned, right? 29, I'm all right. Yet I feel if someone said on Christmas Eve, this is an old man, he's uh, 65 years old. Come, see the oxen kneel. In the lonely barton by yonder coom our childhood used to know. See the language, by the way, barton, yonder coom. Go back to a little boy. If at this age, an old man, right, 18, 1917, well on in years, and no fool, somebody said to me, oh, let's see if they're out there. What would he do? Would he say, I know the truth? He says, well, I, I, I go take a look. At least <laughs> those last lines are hoping it might be so. Now watch what happens. That's a very nice ending, but it's not totally nice right? because you know that if there were another stanza on this poem, they wouldn't be there with that. So it has to be a poem of not ceasing to wish, right? Not a poem of finding, right? But the glory. All right. Should we start again? <laughs> I usually uh, use the poem I just read to you, The Ruined Maid, as a, a light moment when I'm teaching because it's a funny poem. And most often with students, I don't go on to talk about it, but I want to say a word or two about it. Because you are supposed to be amused by it. But if you think about it very long, you realize it's not an amusing poem. It's whichever direction you go in terms of those two characters, it's sad. And Hardy is never funny just to be funny. Um, he wants you to laugh, and then he wants you to think. The woman who is ruined is, in a sense, ruined. That is, she's ruined because she's gone to the city, given up her virtue, and the rewards are, are, are clear, right? You get soft hands instead of rough hands. You get manners. You get society. You get a lot. But all the same, she's a ruined maid. That is, she cannot go home. She is picked. She's a woman of the streets. If she went back to her home, they would expel her for her loss of her virtue. The woman who is good is miserable. Right? In fact, she envies the woman who left and gave up virtue because she sees so many things she would like. Uh, her hands are miserable. Right? Her language is crude. She is worked to death. Well, she's honorable. All right. She's kept her virtue. But uh, wouldn't any woman like some nice clothes, soft hands? Yeah. You notice that in Hardy's world, these things don't go together. Being virtuous does not mean right, that you get rewards such as good clothes, good language, society, right, gentleness. If you're a virtuous country woman in Hardy's world, you work yourself to death at about the age 30. Tess, very much so. Tess was a ruined maid. When she got ruined, then she got Yes, but she was ruined all the same. So it's a sad poem, aside from the humor. But I didn't want to leave it with you at that point. Let's read a few more poems that express some of the uh, Hardy-esque uh, temperaments here. Turn to page 15 on his immortality. Here's that dilemma. Um, in the old days, if you were good, right, if you lived the right life, you would expect certain kind of rewards for it. At the very least, you might expect paradise, right, happiness in the long run. 
what if you're alive in 1900 and you're good? Uh, where is immortality to somebody who no longer believes that immortality is waiting for you? So here's, as is often the case with Hardy, a, a poem on this kind of topic. His immortality shares a typical Hardy frame. That is, it's, it's a normal language. You notice that. Hardy is never highly elevated as a poet. Excuse me. He shares this with Hausman, who also uses ordinary language, unlike Hopkins, who uses elevated language of very unique kind. I saw a dead man's finer part shining within each faithful heart of those bereft. Then said I, this must be his immortality. So he thinks, in other words, of a man's good qualities, and he sees that all the people around him say, show that his goodness has its effect. And this is how we are immortal on the people we affect, after all. You see, the poem starts off from the point of, point of view that you're not told all immortality. You discover what it might be on your own. So there's no heaven here, no paradise. But he still wants a sense of continuity. Who wants to die and rot away? Nobody does. So he said, now I thought I know what it was. This is immortality. The good that you influence people to in your life. I looked there as the seasons wore, and still his soul continuously bore a life in theirs, but less its shine excelled than when I first beheld. That's another trouble problem. You live so long as he was living, right? You live long enough to see that what he once had faith in, that goodness transmitted to other people will stay, to realize that it doesn't hold up quite so, so far. Emerson, in one of his essays, says, if I could get in touch with truth, even if it were grief, and have it stay, I would be glad to have it. But one of the hardest parts of being alive is the evanescence of all things. Right? That every time you think you have it, it's just a matter of time before it slips away. You name what it is. Anything. He said, I lost my son. He lost his son at the age of nine or ten. He was a wonderful boy. He was in great pain. He said, at least I thought, now I know. I know grief. A year later, he says, it's as though I lost a great estate. As though I lost some property. It still hurts, but it's not anywhere near the same. None of these things last. This is the 19th century, over and over again. Give me the truth, Ahab's quest. I want to get in touch with it. Emerson uses a very different way. He's saying the same thing here. Now I thought I knew what it was. Certainty. Oh, no, no. Do you remember Bob? Which Bob? Yes, one of the man was. OK, it's still lasting. His fellow yearsmen passed. And then in later hearts, I looked for him again and found him shrunk. Alas, the thin and spectral mannequin. Lastly, I ask, now old and chill, if aught of him remain unpaired still, and find in me alone a feeble spark, dying in the dark. Curious. Where is everybody? He's lived long enough to have outlived all the people who remember this man, right? He says, How many of you remember that, that wonderful man? before my time. The only one left. Where is immortality? It's in Thomas Hardy, who is old enough to remember somebody from years ago that no one remembers. I think I may have mentioned to you, my grandmother died in her 90s, her mid-90s. Always a very sociable woman. Knew everybody in town. My grandfather was a county councilman. She ran a grocery store and had connections. And I always thought, as a boy, when Graham dies, the funeral is going to be immense. Well, she died at 93. And, uh, ready, and it's just very small people. She had outlived everybody. A few elderly women came in who were younger than she, for the most part, who remembered her and the daughters of her friends, a few. But uh, she lived long enough and had outlived. That's a, if you live a good life, that's a long time and a good time to live. And she did, so I wasn't sad about it. But I had simply forgot how, if you die at 18, if you die at 95, you're lucky if you have a grandchild to take care of you, right, to bury you right. So here he is talking about that dissolution of things, right? Give me the truth. Now let's look at another one. Um, it's a ni that's a nice little poem. This was uh, his immortality. Turn to page 17, the, the bottom of the next page, the comet at Yellow. 
Well, here's a, he's seeing a comet pass over the sky. Halley's Comet was a big deal. This is not Halley's Comet. I don't think, or is it? No, 1902 was too early. Um, but he sees one of these sky travelers going. It bends far over Yellum Plain, and we from Yellum Height stand and regard its fiery train so soon to swim from sight. It will return long years hence, when as now its strange swift shine will fall on yellow, but not then, on that sweet form of It's the same form, right? It's the same idea. Mark Twain was born with Haley's Comet and said all his life that he would go when it go, when it went, came again, and he did. He, he came and died with Haley's Comet. The point, of course, is that the world has its cycles, but we do not. Yes, very much so. Grab it now because it's not coming back. You can see connections with this with literature all over. April is the cruelest month, T.S. Eliot says. What do you mean? Because every April the world gets new again and I'm another year older. Right? <laughs> I wish I could be renewed, but I can't be. This, is, this poem, by the way, if you're thinking ahead, should sound a lot like Hausman. Okay, this is a Hausman poem. Hardy has a few poems which sound so much like Hausman that if you didn't know how he wrote them, you would think Hausman had to do them. Because Hausman's tone is the regret for time passing. Over and over, that's his, that's his song. Time passes and I'm young, and even youth passes fast. And this is one of those Hausman-esque poems. Uh, let's read it through. Not just, it bends far over Yellum Plain. And we, from Yellum Height, Stand and regard its fiery train so soon to swim from sight. We could even ask a few interesting little questions about this. You see that the first image is of a comet sweep over the sky, bending, right? And here we are on the top watching. The image is of us looking at it, but it's motion. The whole stand has to do with motion. Right? Things are going on. The comet will not stand still for our regard. It's going about its business. And as we watch its fiery train, the word train, motion, right? It's a consequence of its motion through the sky. So soon to swim from sight. It's on its way out of the sky. And then we have the, the, the conclusion of the appearance. It will return long years hence. And I've always wanted to look up to see what a comet that was and when it's coming back. I've always, it's, it's occurred to me that it might be that it's an every five year comet, you know? <laughs> we should ruin the poem. It's got to be every couple of hundred years probably. When now, when as now, its strange swift shine will fall on yellow, but not then on that sweet form of time. Two points I want to make about that. The first, you notice that it is me versus the world around me. That is, that comic will go its business. This is the bird in the darkened trash. Right? The bird sings because it's a bird. That's where birds are. The comics come because it's their time to come. And later on, in 200 years, it'll come again. Complete indifference to us, right? It goes by its own rules. So that, first of all, you see, it has that sense of isolation that Hardy is so aware of, me versus the world around me, okay? My inability to adapt to it, to live with it. Then you have the internal. Hardy is very aware of me and you. This should remind you of something like Dover Beach, right? We're in the late 19th century, if you know that one, where uh, Matthew Arnold is saying there's nothing out there to rely on at all except our uh, love that's all we have. And in the 20th century, I don't trust you, right? Only me. So he says, it will fall on young, but not then on that sweet form of time. What do we not have here? Hope. We don't have much hope, but there's something else I was thinking of. No, we have that too. There's a sadness oh. there, right? I was thinking of the me. Right? He doesn't say it will not no, fall, this light will not fall on me again. It's on, yes. So this is a poem of loss of love. We can make the extension. If it's not going to fall on her, somebody else is not going to fall on either. <laughs> and his name is T.H., right? But all the same, this is a less ego egocentric poem than some of the others. It's the loss of her rather than the loss of self that uh, comes to us. Let's try a couple others. I'm trying to do some short ones here. Um, turn to uh, the self same song on page 47. more 
the same. A bird sings the self same song, with never a fault in its flow, that we listened to here these long, long years ago. A pleasing marvel is how a strain of such rapturous rote should have gone on thus till now, unchanged in a note. But it's not the self same bird. No, perished to dust is he, as also are those who heard that song. An old man here, as you can see, he's 82 years old when he wrote this. And when you're 82, you might want to think about that childhood you had. Can you see the same relationship? Here I am, a human being. When I hear the river will, when I hear here, uh, I think of when I was 25. Because my wife and I lived in an apartment, and there was a field outside, and every summer we hear those birds. So for me, already I can go back. That's a long time ago. Not as far as for most of you. But still, it's a long ways ago. And the sense that, that is that the same bird? It sounds exactly yeah. like? It sounds exactly <laughs> like the bird. Birds keep the same song, right? Uh, trees are the same. They renew themselves without a sense of individuality. Right? So it, the fact that it's a different whippoorwill is irrelevant to nature. I mean, the whippoorwills recreate themselves every year. And until they put the highway through, you're going to have whippoorwills. And then you won't have whippoorwills anymore. And I haven't heard one, by the way years. Are there ripple wheels out here? No. They're not. I don't think so. Let's read it through again quickly and catch a few points. A bird sings the self-same song. It's curious that he uses the word self-same instead of same. I always ask students why you use two words when you have one that will do. It's not just the same song, it's the exact song. Right? And we could sing the same song. Each one of us could sing uh, some song that we know, right, and uh, and say that's the same song. But no, it's not that we're different voices singing the same song. It is the exact song. Its interior is the same, in other words. I remember a sermon when I was in college and talking about the importance of individuals. And he told about his little girl who had a doll, mass produced by the billions, who broke it. I mean, he broke it. He dropped it. And the, the little girl was angry. She was about five. She said, I want my dolly. He said, don't worry, I'll get you another dolly just like it. I don't want another dolly just like it. I want that dolly. <laughs> right? And he couldn't convince her that another dolly exactly the same would be, it wasn't. She wanted the self-same doll. And she was in grief because of that. But he's saying, you see, that they are exactly the same. Right? It doesn't make any difference that it's 60 years later. A whippoorwill is a whippoorwill is a whippoorwill. A rose is a rose is a rose. With never a fault in its flow that we listen to here those long, long years ago. What's the crucial word here? We. We. He's remembering me and right? That's important too, yeah. This, but you can go back to the same spot, but you can't go back to the same people. And he's thinking of it could be a woman, it could be a friend, or a group. Right? I remember when I was a boy, and he's thinking about it. A pleasing, pleasing marvel is how a strain of such rapturous rote should have gone on thus till now, unchanged. If you've lived 82 years, you can make that. It's not one bit different. The key, uh, crucial, the key word here is pleasing. It makes me feel good to know that I may be old, right? But birds are the same. And that that God just replaces one bird with another. So though I'm old, I don't really live in a different world, except where it counts. Except where it counts. But it's not the self-same bird. It takes you back to the first line. A bird sings the self-same song, but it's not the self-same bird. No perish to dust is he, as also are those who heard that song. We is the crucial word in the second stanza. Me is the crucial word at the end. I am here by myself. Does he make a comment about his feelings like that? You notice that the last line is a restrained comment. He does not say, oh, woe is me. I am alone. I beat my breast. How awful it is to have outlived the people who heard this with me. In fact, it would be a much worse song, poem, if he did. 
It's a very good poem because what he does is make the observation and leave it to us to feel the loss that he's hearing and hearing those birds. Let's read a wonderful poem. I get a little bit away from the sadness here. The Fallow Deer at the Lonely House. I like this poem very much. It's not so sad. Where is it? One right above this one. Page 46. <coughs> one without looks in tonight through the curtain of chink from the sheet of glistening white. One without looks in tonight as we sit and think by the fender brink. We do not discern those eyes watching in the snow lit by lamps of rosy dyes. We do not discern those eyes wondering or is that nice? um, well, let's talk about it for a few minutes. The title tells you what's happening. Right? They are sitting in the winter around the fireplace. The deer comes up and looks through their windows, and he's watching them. He's working in this little poem, which seems so simple, in a very complex, uh, in a very complex uh, situation. What does, the, what does the deer see in his wildness? Right? looking through the chinks of the window at us human beings sitting around the fire, being warm. Curious situation. The poem is about differentness, as so much of Hardy is. It's not a poem of sadness, however. It's just an exclamation of otherness. It's not a, it, it would be different if it were a human being, right? If it were me looking in, you'd call the police. I have a peeper, <laughs> right? Uh, but a deer can't peep. That is, whatever is in the mind of a deer watching these people he is pure in a human sense. Right? He's doing, he's just watching. What's in the mind? I, I find it very unnerving to be watched by animals, stared at by animals, right? <laughs> it's worse than with human beings, as you know the dirty thoughts they have. But what's going on? <laughs> what's going on in this deer's mind? Um, the fallow deer at the lonely house. Did you notice that in the poem he does not use the word deer? He could say, a deer without looks in tonight. He uses the word one, which collapses the deer's otherness with our otherness, right? We are one, you could refer to a person, right? So it's it, it being, in other words, one without, and that means outside, it doesn't mean without something. Right? One without looks in tonight through the curtain of the From the sheet of glistening white. What is that, by the way? Snow. Snow. No. What's you? Yes, you're right. It is. This is snow. Did you say the snow? Yeah. Okay, yes, it's the snow on there. He's standing on the snow, looking through. Sorry, I, I caught you saying something else. One without. Tonight, as we sit and think by the fender brink. It's like really a cute, nice little poem. What are we doing? We are sitting there by the fireplace, thinking. I just love the image. Let's sit and think around the fire. <laughs> See them sitting there meditating. The I, the image of them, whatever, we don't know what they're thinking about, right? Whatever it is, is what human beings think about mortgages, probably, and the taxes. <laughs> uh, uh, as a fellow said this morning, I was driving into work. Not only is the, are the necessities of life, life three times more expensive, but you can hardly drink them anymore. <laughs> so here we are. And the, the paradox of this poem is that these people are undoubtedly sitting like this around the fireplace, right? Mm -hmm. The birds, I mean, the, the deer is back there. They don't know. They're not thinking about deer. They're ignorant of them. And yet this is a crucial event in a sense. Um, they're coming together in an experience. But they're thinking about the Ayatollah, right, or whatever, watching the fire. We do not discern those eyes watching the snow. Discern means see. Get see against eyes. The deer sees. He's watching. But we don't know he's there. Lit by lamps of rosy eyes. But lit, what, what does that mean? Lit by lamps of rosy eyes. The reflection of the fire. It's a fire, yeah. Okay, so if you could see him, which we do not do, our fire would be inside his eyes, reflecting. So there's a relationship between our, li our light, our fire, and this deer who is looking at the fire. Because he would be lit up in his eyes by us. 
wondering a glow for me. You hear that, dear? Yeah. Look at those words, wondering. First take wondering. Just wondering. Wondering. What is the deer thinking? That's the one inside the deer's head. Um, it must be the equivalent of looking at something totally incomprehensible to us. What does that mean? But if I listen to a piece of music by Charles Ives, <laughs> I just, I'm like that deer. I can't, atonal a music doesn't say anything to me at all. I can't make sense of it. Uh, my students are absolutely overwhelmed with interest in the Rolling Stones concert. That's all they talk about, right? I, I see them on TV and I, you know, give me the Beatles. You know? <laughs> I mean, I could sing a Beatle melody, right? I mean, the Beatles gave wonderful songs to the, to the music world. But the Rolling Stones are just cacophony to me. But they know them. And I trust the fact that there is something there. But not to me. I mean, I am a deer to the, to the Rolling Stones. So here is that deer trying to me. And then you get a glow. There's the eyes, right? Fire. Four-footed. What does four-footed do? Well, it establishes that it's a deer. It's you well, you get from the title that it is a deer. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. It's an animal. We, we don't walk it. I wouldn't if I was walking one foot in the snow, right? But here we are, that otherness. And then tiptoe. Why tiptoe? Oh, yes. Okay. First of all, deers walk that way. I mean, they have to. They don't have anything but tiptoes, right? So you can see the deer coming in. Correct. But also. What does tiptoe mean to us? Why? If you were a deer, would you tiptoe around people? No. No. Whatever. The deer knows there is that alien quality. If we sit there and we hear something, where is the deer? Gone. The deer knows. It wants to know more. It watches. I think it's a thoroughly beautiful poem. This is the poem that convinced me I was wrong last night when I told Mary that I didn't really like Hardy, but I like Hardy. I think his poem is absolutely superb. Okay, that's the, the fallow deer at the lonely house. Turn now over to um, page 15 again. And a few other randomish poems. Time is passing too fast. Always does when I'm here. Mute opinion. And this has to do with President Nixon's uh, silent majority. <laughs> I traversed a dominion whose spokesmen spake out strong, their purpose and opinion through pulpit, press, and song. I scarce had means to note there a large-eyed few and dumb, who thought not as those thought there that stirred the heat and hum. When, grown a shade, beholding that land and lifetime trod, to learn as if its unfolding fulfilled its clamored code, I saw in web unbroken its history outwrought, not as the loud had spoken, but as the mute. This doesn't sound like him at all. It's very different from everything we've looked at. But you see what he's saying? I was a boy, and I grew up in the heart of Victorian England, right? Empire. Right? The big speakers, it was, they were, England was filled with great orators, Gladstone and Disraeli, the whole batch. And I remember everybody talking about power, right, position. We're going to do this. We are so strong. The point you get is there is a connection after all. This is back to the old world, where what the, what the, what the loud say doesn't have to come to pass because they say it. Right? Uh, maybe the quiet ones, maybe the quiet ones, will rule in the end. There's no more consistency. Just as God won't tell you this is the way it's going to happen, don't think politicians have any more power than God. And they won't work, either, won't work it out either. It's a nice little poem, and it ends very strongly, as you can see. Uh, I have a feeling that he's sort of prideful, that right? the big talkers, the ones who think they're going to overwhelm the earth, don't really run, uh, run it in the end. Very different in some ways. OK, that's, uh, let's try another one. I'll uh, speed up a little bit. Uh, we did that. Uh, to number 29. This is a poem I use frequently to talk to students in my American Lit class when we're doing <coughs> All Quiet on the Western Front. 
which is uh, that man, not American, but popular fiction, which is a novel. Some of you probably remember. It's a powerful, powerful book about World War One, you know, the horrible disasters of that. Hardy is one of those who brings us around to what's going to be a, a major theme. In World War One destroyed the idea of honor and war. Right? Uh, you're going to have Siegfried Sassoon pretty shortly, and uh, Wilfred Owen and others who talk about this and find out that now it's gone. Uh, the war in World War One is misery, it's pain, it is gas fumes, right, killing you, it's endless years in veterans' hospitals if you live. Uh, there's no honor anymore. Now he comes at it before this time, this is 1902, but he's already touching upon some thoughts which for the most part were not thinkable much before this period. He says, I killed a man. It could be in reference to say the Boer War, which was already by this time, the man he killed. You notice this in quotation marks, so it's a meditation. Had he and I but met by some old ancient inn, we should have sat us down to wet right many a nipperkin. That means to drink a lot and wet a napkin, many a napkins. But ranged as infantry, and staring face to face, I shot at him as he at me, and killed him in his place. I shot him dead because, because he was my foe. Just so, my foe, of course he was. That's clear enough. Although he thought he'd list perhaps offhand life, just as I. I was out of work, I told his traps, no other reason why. Yes, quaint and curious war is. You shoot a fellow down, you treat it met where any bar is. I help to have a crown. There's the dilemma of the soldier, you see. You stand up and shoot someone dead. Why does the other guy die? I shot at him as he at me. Killed him in his place. Fortunes of war. Uh, I think any soldier knows the, the strangeness of that. Um, if, you, if you fought World War II, you would shoot down somebody who you might have come from the same village. Right? Um, you face Germans, I mean, German soldiers came from ordinary families with mothers and children, and they, they why did they join the army? Well, as he says, I, well, he, he was offhand, he's out of work, he sold his traps, and he didn't have his equipment, and then you get a free meal, and uh, you know, maybe a little honor. And, but if you met them in 1935, we're not talking about Nazis now, I'm talking about just foot soldiers, right? What would you do in a bar? You met him in a bar outside of Munich someplace and say, oh, yeah, beer, right? Bring the girls here and have a good time. The, the awful part, of course, is that it's not the presidents and the, right, the generals who die. It's the people who just aren't there. It's that this is very much the hardy world. I lived, he died. In All Quiet on the Western Front, which is a German novel based upon the experience that Eric Maria Remarque had in World War I, he has his character, Neat, who is a German soldier, meet a Frenchman. They're trapped in a, in a hole. The lines have passed by. He can't get out. He stabs the Frenchman to death. Well, you know, you, you kill Frenchmen if you're a German soldier. That's the way it is. He makes a big mistake. Uh, his man doesn't die quickly. He dies slowly. And he starts to worry about him. And the man dies. And then he opens up his shirt, and he takes out his billfold. And he sees a photograph of his wife and his two kids. And he sees his... Uh, identification card, and it says, uh, uh, Gérard Duval, compositeur. His name was Gérard Duval, he's a printer. Mm -hmm. so you, you do not look into it. You don't fold it, and then you kill him more. You kill Frenchmen, you don't kill Gérard Duval. You don't look at his wife's face. You don't look at his children. It, it destroys Paul. He can no longer be a soldier. He can't just shoot at a blue uniform. You see the point? He's working on the same idea. This is an, a sort of important poem in the evolution of attitude towards war from the point of view of the foot soldier. You don't want to shoot Gerard de Long. You don't want to think what he's thinking. Yeah? Why would you say the quotation marks? Because he's speaking right to you. It's a, med it's a meditation. Okay. So, why would you say the man he's Oh, this is a comment on the speaker. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. He's talking about this. The title. What you want to see is that this is not Hardy. This is a, create, a creation of Hardy. And Hardy, in his title, is commenting on this man who's thinking, oh, I shot him down. But isn't it funny? If I had met him in a bar in Dorset, I'd have given him a drink. Right? You don't kill a, an enemy for hatred. 
There's a difference, right? You, if you kill somebody with hatred, that's a reason. But this is just an accident. These people have met any other place. The odds are pretty high. He tries to reason with himself in the poem, you see. He's got the, the government's language right there. I shot at him as he at me, <coughs> and killed him in his place. I shot him dead because, well, he was my foe. Just so, my foe, of course he was. You see the repetition there? Well, why? The government said, you kill all the Germans you get a hold of. Right? My grandfather's name was Stuver. His father came from Germany. But now I kill all the Germans I get a hold of. Right? You see what I mean? So, but he, he can't make it work. That's clear enough. I would have been dead if I hadn't shot him. But if I had met him anyplace else, he can't get that out of his head. So he, again with party, he leaves it off. Think about this. What does this mean? That's the man he killed. Uh, channel firing is an interesting poem. Hardy likes to get up on we haven't seen too many of these today, but he likes to, to talk sort of in broad terms about fate and God and things like that. He, he thinks that there are sort of gods throwing dice, playing games with us. It's almost a Greek world in some ways, where the god of chance will take over. And here you watch, somebody's hearing the firing of the, the guns during World War I. This is 1914. That night your great guns, unawares, shook all our coffins as we lay and broke the chancel window squares, we thought it was the judgment day. Who's speaking here? The dead, right? The uh, guns are being fired across the French uh, the channel there, uh, the English channel, and all the dead in the church hear the windows breaking in the church, and they think, oh, this is the last trump, right? Everybody ready to get up and sat upright. <laughs> While drearisome arose the howl of wakened hounds, the mouse let fall the altar crumb the worms drew back into the mounds, strong. The glebe cow drooled. You hear odd things happening here. Uh, the mouse, for example, letting fall the altar crumbs. This is from the Eucharist. You're not supposed to let that stuff lie around. This is after the Eucharist has already been made into the body and blood of Christ. But this is the real world, after all, right? And if you can leave it there, yeah, you'll get a mouse there to, to eat it. Till God called. No! It's gunnery practice out at sea. How does he do it? What's God doing? So get back in your comments. <laughs> right? Not time yet. <laughs> I'll let you know when the last judgment's here. It's going to practice out at sea. Just as before you went below, the world is as it used to be. No change. Right? All nations striving strong to make red war yet redder. Mad as hatters, they do no more for Christ's sake than you who are helpless in the flesh man. That this is not the judgment hour, for some of them is a blessed thing. For if it were, they'd have to scour hell's floor for so much threatening. Scour hell's floor for so much threatening. What does that mean? If this were judgment day, where would they be? Yeah. Doing what? Scouring. Scouring. Right? Scouring. He'd put them right at the bottom. God would... Ha ha! It will be warmer when I blow the trumpet, if indeed I ever do. For you are men. Rest eternal sorely need. So down we lay again. I wonder, will the world ever same or be, said one, than when he sent us under in our indifferent century? And many a skeleton shook his head. Instead of preaching forty year, my neighbor Parson thirdly said, I wish I had stuck to pipes and beer. <laughs> Why, by the way, didn't do any didn't good do at good. all. Again, the guns disturb the hour, roaring their readiness to avenge. As far <coughs> even as Stourton Tower, Camelot, Star and Stone. Curious ending, right? Mm -hmm. All these fable places. Stourton Tower is King Alfred's. Camelot, of course, is King Arthur. How far do you hear the noise? All the way to Stonehenge. Are people any different than they have ever, ever been? Do they learn? I read this and I have to think of World War II. He thought World War I was a sign of what did we do 30 years later. And if he had lived long enough, he would have said, I told you so. I give you the weapons, you'll destroy yourselves. You've never learned. But would he think of it this way? Oh, what would it, he would say very. He would say, I'm sure, uh, just give you time. Someday Reagan will wake up with a migraine and push the button. 
that's the way we are, hopeless. We had 40 years preaching, won't do any good at all. Or uh, whoever's president. Yeah, I think he would have a totally fatalistic attitude towards our inability to reform. Uh, this is a funny poem, but you know, there's that same Hardy-esque seriousness underneath. Uh, quite something. Oh, let's see, maybe we can do a couple more short ones. Number, uh, page 47. If grief comes early, joy comes late. If joy comes early, grief will wait. I, my dear. Wise ones joy them early, while the cheeks are red. Banish grief till surly time has dulled their dread. And joy being ours, ere youth has flown, the later hours may find us gone. I, my dear. There's Hausman again, right? <laughs> Gather ye rosebuds while ye may, and old time is a flying. You better arrange your life to get your happiness sooner. You may have happiness later, right? But don't run your life to do it that way. You may not live long enough to get it. So he says, take your youth, your pleasures, while you're young. If you're old, you can resort to whatever you have to suffer through after you've had them. You can always look back on them, in other words, right? This is a song. I don't know the melody, so I can't sing it for you. If grief comes early, joy comes late. If joy come early, grief will wait. I think this must be an old saying. It sounds like an aphorism, doesn't it? Yeah. Something my grandmother would say, grief comes early, joy. It's something they use to, to uh, calm people down who are having tough times. Oh. What about I, my dear and tender? What does that mean? I, my dear and tender. I, my dear. Tender is the odd one, right? To say I, my dear is all right, but what does tender mean? Yeah. Yeah, okay. He's talking to a beautiful young woman, right? But yeah. that's like, we used to say when we, when we were kids uh, and we were too giddy, something about uh, your roses, roses are green. I don't know that. No, no. Mm -hmm. Something to that effect. Well, he's giving advice to somebody young and tender anyway. Okay? Wise ones joy them early, while the cheeks are red. Banish grief till surly time has dulled. Try the next one, a drizzling Easter morning, uh, back to the old song. And he has risen. Well, be it so. Hear the normal language. And still the pensive lands complain and dead men wait as long ago, as if much doubting they would know what they are ransomed from before they pass again their sheltering door. I stand amid them in the rain while blusters vex the you and vain. Down the road, the weary wain plods forward, laden heavily, and, toiler, and toilers with their aches are fain for endless rest, for risen sleep. Now well, we're back to the oxen, in some ways, aren't we? Every Easter, we say, Christ is risen. In some religions, in fact, that's the way you greet. I think the Greek Orthodox greet everyone on Easter Day, but Christ is risen, right? Isn't that the way you speak them, right? So it's a reminder of the resurrection. But his reaction is, well, so what's the change? Be it so, people are working themselves to death as ever. Time is passing. I want to read to you a poem that I didn't did a lot about himself called Afterwards. He says, I would like you to say this about me long after I've died. When the present has latched its postern behind my tremulous stay, and the May month flaps its glad green leaves like wings, delicate filmed as new spun silk. Will the neighbors say, he was a man who used to notice such things? If it be in the dusk, when like an eyelid soundless blink, the dewfall hawk comes crossing the shades to alight upon the wind warped upland thorn, a gazer may think, to him, this must have been a familiar sight. If I pass during some nocturnal blackness, mothy and warm, 
when the hedgehog travels furtively over the lawn. One may say, he strove that such innocent creatures should come to no harm, but he could do little for them, and now he's gone. If, when hearing that, I have been stilled at last, they stand at the door, watching the full starred heavens that winter sees. Will this, will this thought rise on those who meet my face no more? He was one who had an eye for such mysteries. And will any say, when my bell of quittance is heard in the gloom, and a crossing breeze cuts a pause in its outrollings, till they rise again, as they were a new bell's groom? He hears it not now. Hardy. What can Hardy, and it's an interesting poem as well, what can you claim if you have Hardy's vision? Did he see things? Did he notice things? You see, he, Hardy's not a man who will say, this is the answer to the problems of life, which is what we all would like. I mean, who wouldn't like that? But he is a man who's able to say, these are the problems. This is the world. He would like someone to say, when they see, as he says, when you see the full starred heavens that winter sees, will people say he was one who had an eye for such mysteries? Well, it's a mystery. Pardon? He wanted that humor. He wanted that, yeah, right. He wanted to be remembered that way. And of course, I think he won that. Because when you see the stars, you might say, Hardy would have wondered about that. He couldn't give you the answer. But he could wonder about it. And that's what it is, of course, in this century to be a poet in many ways be alive and to be human. The key word is mysteries. Mysteries. It's all a mystery. And mysteries are frustrating because we always want to read the last chapter first. Right? We want to know, but there's no end to the mystery that Hardy perceives. I, I like this poem and I like to end with it because I can't think of another poem in which Hardy uses green nature. And the May month flaps its glad green leaves like wings. Delicate film is new spun silk. Will the neighbors say he was a man who used to notice such things? Well, they might not. You, know, you don't get many evidences of that in his poetry, that he's been busy noticing such things at all. Um, I think he would like to have been remembered for that, but his uh, tone is a little gloomier than that. Next week, we'll move to, uh, how shall I say this? Hardy is not a man of despair, but he is a man of the neutral tones. All right? When we move to Gerard Manley Hopkins, you will find he is on both of the other sides of Hardy. Hopkins is capable of an elation and a glory you will seldom come across in poetry. He's also capable of a despair that you have to be a Christian to understand um, that Hardy could not see. Hardy couldn't despair because he didn't have the, the answers to the questions that would have given him the despair that Hopkins has. But Hopkins, who was a devout priest and worked at his profession all of his life, feels both the despair a Christian on this earth who knows he can't be what he wants to be. And, of course, the tremendous glory of being a man of the cloth who believes in it and is getting the rewards. It's not a simple, neutral life. So we'll see, and we'll see some wonderful poems. One of my favorite poems of all is, um, is a Hopkins poem. And it's, it's a very Hardy-esque poem. Do you know, Margaret, are you grieving? Over golden grove on leaving leaves like the things of man do that next week, among other things. Um, but it's the state of mankind in this time of the century, I guess. And then on to the, the bitterness of Hausman at the end. So that's Hardy. What See you next week. Afterwards. Afterwards. Well, afterwards. 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 Yeah. Okay. Oh, you can have that. Oh, these are extra sheets. Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah, it's the sake biography is being given a big play. Yeah. Yeah.